Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. In this quick look video we'll take a look at IFR clearances, what they are, what they contain, and how to obtain them. FAR 91-173 states that no person may operate an aircraft in controlled airspace under IFR unless they filed an IFR flight plan and received an appropriate IFR air traffic control clearance. An ATC clearance is defined as an authorization for an aircraft to proceed under specific conditions within controlled airspace. So in the real world, for all practical purposes, you need to get an IFR clearance before you take off in instrument conditions to be legal to operate under instrument flight rules. An IFR clearance has five elements to it, and you can use the acronym CRAFT, C-R-A-F-T, to remember them. The elements are your clearance limit, route, altitude, air traffic control frequency, and transponder code. Let's look at each one in detail. The clearance limit is the final point you're cleared to on your IFR flight plan. 99% of the time this will be your destination airport. If the airport you're flying to is experiencing heavy traffic, delays, or any other type of disruption, you may be cleared to a point on your flight plan that is short of your destination airport, though this is pretty rare nowadays. ATC generally prefers to hold aircraft on the ground rather than clearing them to a point short of their destination airport and making them hold in the air. In the unlikely event that your clearance limit is a point short of the airport, ATC should also give you an expect further clearance or EFC time for that point. Basically a time you can expect to be cleared from that point to your destination airport along your route. The next element of your clearance is your route. A standard instrument departure will be included in your route clearance if needed, even if you filed the standard instrument departure in your flight plan. Obstacle DPs generally will not be included in your clearance, but should be flown unless alternate instructions are provided by ATC in your clearance or in your takeoff clearance, or you are given or filed a standard instrument departure. If there are no obstacle DPs at your departure airport and you're not filed or cleared via a standard instrument departure, you should fly the standard diverse departure procedure and then comply with your clearance or ATC instructions. ATC may issue departure instructions in your clearance. It's not uncommon for them to say on departure, fly runway heading, expect radar vectors uh, to your first fix, or you know, give you a heading to fly after departure. If you're cleared via your flight plan route, you will be issued an abbreviated clearance. You will be cleared as filed. That way, instead of having to read the entire route to you, they'll just tell you you're cleared as filed and you know that what you put in your flight plan is the route you need to fly. If ATC changes your routing, you may be issued a full route clearance and the entire route will be read in the clearance. If ATC amends or changes just as changes just a portion of the route, they may read the portion of the route that was amended and abbreviate the rest. And we'll see an example of that in our sample clearances in a little bit. And a pilot can always request a full route clearance if they wish to clarify the routing. Sometimes this happens if you file two flight plans, maybe you filed a flight plan for a certain route and then realize that was going to take you through weather. And so you file a different route and you just want to clarify uh, which route you're being cleared uh, by and which flight plan they have and which flight plan is active for you in the system. Uh, so you can request a full route clearance to make sure that what you have programmed into your GPS or FMS or what you're planning to fly is the same thing that they are expecting you to fly. Standard terminal arrival routes or STARS will not be read in an abbreviated clearance if they were filed in the flight plan. The next element is your altitude clearance. With your altitude clearance, you may be cleared to your filed cruise altitude, or you may be cleared to a lower altitude and then told to expect a higher altitude in a certain amount of time. If you are filed or cleared on a SID that has multiple altitude step-ups and a top altitude, you may be cleared to climb via the SID and given the top altitude or another altitude to maintain. Let's take a look at some examples. 
So let's take a look at the Gumby 3 departure at George Bush International uh, Intercontinental in uh, Houston, Texas. The identifier on that airport is Kilo India Alpha Hotel. Uh, this is an RNAV SID. It tells us that if we take off from uh, the southeast facing runways here, uh, I believe this would be runway 15 left and 15 right, uh, we're going to climb straight ahead to 600 feet. Then we turn direct to Cartman, and we're supposed to car cross Cartman at or below 230 knots. Not a problem for most of the airplanes we're flying. And then we're supposed to cross Dawson at or below 4,000, and then Gumby at or below 5,000, and then the top altitude is 16,000. So the way that a clearance would be issued for this, let's assume that we're flying an aircraft that's capable of going up into the flight levels, or at least up to 16,000. Uh, the way we would get the clearance for this, we'll assume we're flying the Citation, the CJ-4. They would say Citation 520 Alpha Hotel, cleared to Pine Bluff via the Gumby 3 departure, Lake Charles transition. So we're assuming that we're going out this way and then on to Pine Bluff. Uh, climb via the SID, departure frequency, and they, they give us the departure frequency, the squawk, and all that sort of stuff. So that gives us clearance to comply with all of these restrictions and climb to and maintain 16,000 once we're past Gumby. Uh, let's say that we're fly, flying our 172, which we can still fly on this uh, departure. Uh, we still have minimum obstacles, uh, obstruction clearance altitudes that are low enough uh, that we wouldn't need to uh, necessarily climb up to these MEAs. Uh, particularly since it's an RNAV departure. Uh, and so, and it does not say it's restricted to turbojets. Uh, so let's assume that we're also taking the 172 out to Pine Bluff. Uh, we're going on the Lake Charles transition, but we filed for 8,000. Uh, so the way we would get the clearance here is Cessna 172 Golf Hotel, cleared to Pine Bluff via the Gumby 3 departure, Lake Charles transition, then is filed, climb via the SID, accept, maintain 8,000, and then they give us the departure frequency, this clock, etc. And so we are still cleared to use, utilize, or, uh, or we are still bound by these restrictions here. Should not be a problem for the 172 to comply with each of those. And then uh, once we are past Gumby, we're cleared to climb to 8,000. So the last two elements are your air traffic control frequency. You'll be given the radio frequency of departure control uh, for air traffic control. Uh, a lot of times if it is not uh, uh, the TRACON for the airport that you are departing from, they will tell you who it is. Uh, for example, in uh, Texarkana, Arkansas, your departure controller will be Memphis Center. So they'll say departure control uh, is going to be Memphis Center and then give you the frequency. And then, of course, the transponder code is very straightforward. You'll be given your uh, IFR uh, transponder code. You just put it into uh, your transponder and make sure that your transponder is turned to altitude uh, before you get airborne. So how do you pick up your IFR clearance? At Towered Airports, it's pretty simple. You contact the appropriate air traffic control frequency and request the clearance from them. At large airports, there will typically be a clearance delivery frequency for handing out IFR clearances and VFR clearances into Class B or C airspace. At smaller towers, the service will usually be combined with ground control, and at the least busy towers or during the least busy times of day, uh, they may handle everything on the tower frequency, and ADIS should tell you which one you need to contact. At uncontrolled fields, you'll need to contact the air traffic control facility that has jurisdiction over the airport. Uh, this ATC facility may have a remote communications outlet from which you can contact them on the ground. They, uh, this is just a remote transmitter and antenna placed on the field that remotely connects you uh, to their facility uh, via a certain frequency, usually listed as a clearance delivery frequency uh, in the airport facility directory. Uh, they may actually be able to receive you on the ground using the uh, frequency that you use for departure and approach at that airport if that airport is close enough to the transmitter. And uh, in the real world, if there's no way to get them by radio, you can also uh, use uh, your cell phone uh, to contact the air traffic control facility. Uh, this is becoming a very popular technique uh, in the modern age now. And then in the real world, you can also get your clearance relayed to you via flight service, uh, the flight service station. But flight service is not emulated in Microsoft Flight Simulator. 
When you receive a clearance, you'll want to write it down and then read it back pretty much exactly as ATC has given it to you in its entirety. Uh, ATC should either then tell you read back correct or issue you any corrections. If they issue you corrections, uh, you should then read the corrections back and then they should verify that the corrections are correct. When you get your clearance at an uncontrolled field, ATC has to shut down IFR approaches and departures from that airport uh, for the time they release you until they can positively identify where you are after you take off. Uh, they use two different tools to manage this. Uh, first, they can issue you a clearance void time. This is basically a time limit by which you need to be airborne and after which they will reopen the airport to IFR traffic. You can take off any time between when you receive your clearance and the clearance void time. If you miss the clearance void time, you need to call ATC back and let them know that you haven't taken off. Generally, they're going to know why you haven't taken off and how soon you'll be ready, and then you need to get a new clearance void time. We'll look at an example of that uh, here in just a second. The other tool they use is hold for release. With this method, you uh, get your clearance, but at the end of the clearance, they will tell you to hold for your IFR release, and you can request, request this as well. You then taxi out and notify them when you're number one for departure at the end of the runway, and then they'll give you your IFR release and allow you to take off. Uh, this is probably the more common method now uh, in the age of cell phones and numerous remote radio outlets they've installed at uncontrolled fields. And it shuts down the airspace for around that airport for a much uh, shorter uh, period of time. If the airport you're departing from does not have controlled airspace extending to the ground, uh, ATC may issue you instructions for what to do upon entering controlled airspace as part of your IFR clearance. And we'll look at that as part of our sample clearances. So let's go ahead and take a look at some sample clearances uh, to see some of the different things that you can get thrown at you uh, when you get an IFR clearance. So for our first clearance, we'll look at a, a pretty straightforward flight plan. We are flying from uh, Texarkana Regional Web Field uh, up to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, Texarkana is a Class D airport. It does not have approach control. Approach control services are provided by Memphis Center. Uh, they have a tower frequency and a ground control frequency. And so most likely we'd contact ground, but they should tell us on the ATIS who we need to talk to to get our clearance. We'll assume that the tower is open as well. Our filed route for this route is going to be Texarkana Airport, direct Texarkana VOR, Victor 16 to Pine Bluff VOR, and then direct to the Pine Bluff Airport. And so we get on with ground control. We get our ATIS. We tell them Cessna 172 Golf Hotel uh, on the uh ramp uh, with the current ATIS looking for IFR clearance to Pine Bluff. They call back and they say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel cleared to Pine Bluff as filed, climb and maintain 6000. Departure frequency is with Fort Worth Center on 123925, squawk 5502. So there you can see all of, then we read that back and they should call back and say uh, read back is correct, call when ready for taxi. Uh, which we will do. And you can see all of our clearance elements there. We're clear to Pine Bluff as our clearance limit. Uh, it is our destination airport. Again, 99, probably 0.9% of the time you're going to get that as your clearance limit. Uh, they say climb and maintain 6,000 or it's as filed. So it's an abbreviated uh, clearance. We can expect to go direct to uh, Texarkana and then join Victor 16 and take that to Pine Bluff and then uh, work our way onto an approach up there if needed. Uh, we get our altitude, climb and maintain 6,000, pretty straightforward. They tell us departure frequency is with Fort Worth Center and give us the frequency and give us a squawk code. So that's an example of a pretty straightforward clearance. All right, so for our second clearance, we're going to go from a towered airport in Class B to a towered airport in Class B. Uh, we're going to go from Charles Wheeler Downtown Airport or Kansas City Downtown uh, to the Spirit of St. Louis Airport out in St. Louis. 
and we'll go. Uh, we'll be flying a standard instrument departure to get out of uh, Kansas City and uh, flying a standard terminal arrival route to get into Spirit of St. Louis. We'll just connect the two up. Uh, the filed route will be uh, KMKC via the Lakes 5 departure, Columbia transition, direct to Delma intersection and the Delma 4 arrival into Spirit of St. Louis, and we'll file for an altitude of 5,000. Kansas City Center lists a uh, ground control frequency and a clearance delivery frequency, but they are the same frequency. Uh, so we would dial up 121.9 unless the uh, ATIS tells us to do something else. And uh, we call them up. We say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel looking for our IFR clearance uh, to Spirit of St. Louis. They call back and they say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel cleared to St. Louis or uh, Spirit of St. Louis via the Lakes 5 departure, Columbia transition, then is filed, climb via the SID except maintain 5,000 feet, departure frequency 118.4, squawk 5502. We read that back. Uh, they say read back is correct, advise ready for taxi. Uh, so here you can see we have our clearance limit is our airport again. And, and again, it's extremely unusual not to get that. Uh, then they will give us, even though we filed the departure and the transition, they will give this the give that to us in their clearance, that in our clearance, uh, that is standard procedure. And then they give us the abbreviated as filed. So they don't tell us the arrival since we did file that arrival. They may not say climb via SID. They may just say climb and maintain 5,000 since there are no altitudes uh, to maintain. Although it does say, you know, depending on what run runway you're taking off of, you're supposed to climb a certain heading and then climb to a certain altitude and then uh, climbed on a sign heading um, for radar vectors to maintain the appropriate route. Maintain 10,000 or assigned by ATC. Expect filed altitude 10 minutes after departure. Uh, so they may see climb via the set except maintain 5,000, but some controllers might read it off as climb and maintain 5,000. Uh, let's see here. Departure frequency is pretty straightforward. They don't tell us who it is since we are under uh, Kansas City uh, uh, TRACON at this airport, and then the squawk frequency is uh, fairly straightforward. So for our next clearance, we'll assume that we're going from uh, West Memphis down to Pine Bluff. West Memphis is a uh, uncontrolled airport, and it has a Class E uh, airspace that goes down to uh, 700 feet around the airport. So the airport itself is in Class G airspace, uncontrolled airspace. Uh, so that is something that we will get a different clearance for. They'll tell us what to do when we enter controlled airspace. And... Um, it also underlies the Memphis Kleist Bravo airspace, so we can expect they'll probably not give us our cruise altitude initially. They'll probably keep us down low to get us out from underneath the Class Bravo and then give us a higher altitude once we're clear. So the route that we filed for this is uh, West Memphis direct to Gilmore VOR, Victor 124 to Hill. Uh, Hilly intersection and then Victor 69 to Pine Bluff VOR direct to Pine Bluff Airport. Filed altitude is 6,000. Uh, they do have a clearance delivery frequency listed down here in the airport facility directory. Uh, so that is a remote communications outlet on the ground here at Memphis that connects us with Memphis Approach. Uh, so we would call them up and we would say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel is with you on the ground at West Memphis with the current weather looking for IFR clearance to Pine Bluff. They call back and they say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel cleared to Pine Bluff as filed. Intercontrolled airspace heading 180. Expect vectors to join Victor 124. Climb and maintain 3000. Expect 6000 in 10 minutes. Departure frequency 12465 squawk 5502. We read all of that back to them. They say read back is correct. And then probably what they would do is they'd say, about what time do you think you'll be airborne? Uh, or they may say, you know, hold for release, call me number one at the end. So if they ask us what time uh, we were going to be airborne, they're looking to issue us a clearance void time. Uh, so we'll say, you know, we'll say it's noon right now. We expect to be airborne at about 1210. Uh, they would call back and say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel, Roger, uh, clearance void if not off by uh, 12 minutes past the hour. Time now is 00, zero minutes uh, past the hour. Uh, if not off by uh, 12 minutes past the hour, uh, please advise uh, Memphis 
uh, departure. Uh, and then we would have 12 minutes to get down to the end of the runway and get airborne, or if we can't do that, we need to call them back and allow them to reopen the field. And then once we get airborne, we call them, and that, again, reopens the field once they can identify us on radar. Like I said, the other uh, thing they can do and what they would probably do and what you may want to consider requesting if they don't do it, uh, since they have a frequency on the ground, is just taxi out up to the runway, do your run up, uh, get ready to go, and then call back and say uh, w they would give you a hold for release. Uh, and then you taxi out and hold short and call them up and say, we're number one for departure at runway 17 or wherever you happen to be. And they would uh, call you back and say, uh, Cessna 172 Golf Hotel, Roger, uh, you are released. Uh, they would probably reaffirm the departure frequency and say, Con contact Memphis Center 12465 once airborne. And then it'll only take you, only take you two, two minutes or so to get on the runway, take off, get airborne, and get the field reopened. So it closes down the airspace for a lot shorter period of time. So for the actual clearance, you can see we got our clearance limit as our airport. We got instructions on what to do once we enter controlled airspace at 700 feet above the ground. Uh, they told us to expect vectors, vectors to join Victor 124. So we're not going to have to go all the way up here. They're going to vector us out here and have us join the airway. Uh, and then the departure frequencies with Memphis approach and uh, just gave us a squawk code. Finally, for our last clearance example, we'll say we're going between Fort Smith Regional Airport and uh, through Little Rock and over to Memphis International Airport and flying an arrival into Memphis. Uh, and we have filed via uh, Fort Smith, direct Fort Smith VOR, then Victor 74 down to Little Rock then direct to Marvel VOR, and then the uh, Marvel 6 arrival into Memphis. And unbeknownst to us, uh, this, uh, well, we should know that this is active, but they just activated the restricted area, so they don't want to take any traffic through there. Uh, so they're actually going to reroute us via Victor 534 and uh, route us around, or vector us around the uh, restricted area and then have us join Victor uh, 534 down to Little Rock and then have us fly the rest of the route on file as filed. And uh, so that's what they're going to be presented with in our clearance. It will be an amended route followed by the abbreviated clearance for the rest of the route. Uh, so we call up and we say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel at the ramp with information, current information, uh, looking for IFR clearance to Memphis. They call back and say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel. You are clear to Memphis International via radar vectors to join Victor 534 uh, to Little Rock, then is filed. On departure, fly runway heading, climb and maintain 5000, departure frequency with Razorback departure of 120.9, and squawk 5502. So we have to read that back. Uh, we'll have to read the route clearance for up here. Then is filed is uh, what was on our flight plan from there. And uh, then we'll read the rest of it back and they will either tell us uh, read back is correct and contact ground when ready for taxi or, uh, you know, if we didn't get it correct and they will issue corrections to that. So, again, we've got our clearance limits as our airport. Uh, we've got our new route uh, down to Little Rock and then what we filed on our flight plan for our routing. Uh, they did give us departure instructions, fly runway heading. We're expecting vectors to get on the Victor Airway. And then climb and maintain 5,000 is our altitude, departure frequency, and squawk. And since they gave us uh, instructions of what to do on takeoff, uh, that means the tower, when they issues, they issues their takeoff clearance, uh, will just tell us you're cleared for takeoff, and they assume that we are going to fly runway heading since that was in our IFR clearance. IFR clearances are emulated fairly accurately in the default ATC and Microsoft Flight Simulator, in virtual ATC software like Beyond ATC, and you'll need to be proficient at understanding them, reading them back, and following them to operate IFR on a virtual ATC service like VATSIM. Hopefully this video has helped you understand what to expect when you receive an IFR clearance and how to copy it, read it back, and comply with it, and helped you to become more comfortable about getting IFR clearances when operating IFR in Flight Sim. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it, share with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell to be alerted to new content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.